Hey everybody, welcome to the Dungeon Cast. I'm Will. I'm Brian. This is the podcast where we talk about everything Dungeons and Dragons, from brazen brothels to brave brothers. And today, we're covering bronze dragons. The Dungeon Cast. Bro, 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 bronze dragons. <laughs> yeah, yes. bronze dragons. I like, uh, well, this dragon is... Is bronze. It is uh, bronze. And cool. They're cool guys, right? I think bronze dragons are particularly cool. They're probably my third favorite kind of dragon. So uh-huh. very excited to be talking about them today. They have like long curly hair? They're no. Like, mm, no. So cool. <laughs> so bronze dragons <laughs> are also known as coastal dragons and are noted to be the third most powerful of metallic dragons. Uh, though lawful good as all metallic dragons are, bronze dragons are known specifically for their dutiful and honor-bound nature, and their deep commitment to the idea of order. So they're extra lawful, if you will. Extra lawful, okay. Uh, They have a quite fierce physical appearance compared to most other metallic dragons, despite their inherently good nature. The shape of their heads uh, are often defined by the fluted crests that sweep back from their cheeks and eyes and are ended with smooth, dark, curving horns. Uh, usually three on each side of their face with a large matching pair atop their heads. They also have a beak-like snout with a pair of small horns descending from their chin. Um, Their scales are a deep, rich bronze tinted at the edges of their wings, tails, and frills in green. Um, And they have a prominent green bronze frill that starts at the base of their neck and extends to the tip of their tail. Green. So So what's with the green? Is that like a normal thing? I think that's supposed to be the way that like copper and bronze kind of oxidate over time. Oh, really? I didn't realize that bronze does that as well. I believe so. Yeah, I believe bronze and I think even brass does, but I could be wrong. But either way, it's a really cool look. I encourage anyone to go look in the 5e monster manual because it looks cool. Yeah, it gives it that touch of like, I'm old because I'm oxidized. (laughs) Yeah, sure. But I think green's just my favorite color and it's just, it it got this green gold look. It looks really cool. Now I want to play like a, like an old oxidized dwarf character in like a game. I don't want, don't call me old. I'm oxidized. Gotcha. (laughs) That's a cool idea. I like that. One of the most uh, defining physiological details of bronze dragons though, is that their anatomy is designed for underwater movement as well as air and land. So all bronze dragons have web feet as well as thick webbing behind their forelimbs, like picture, like in their armpit area, Mm -hmm. like little, little webs. That's cool. Like flying Um, squirrel style. Like flying squirrel style. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Furthermore, their wings are also ended with a webbed fin like frill and they have a specific elbow structure within their wing that allows them to flap underwater. So bronze dragons can essentially fly through water. That's ridiculous. It's super fucking cool. <laughs> that, that's that's ridiculous. Can you imagine? You just look under, <laughs> oh shit. Why does it look like it's in the sky? <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. So yeah, they're they're one of the most prominent uh, swimmers amongst dragon kind. Wow, man. Uh, probably only uh, rivaled by black dragons and gold dragons, but... I can Those see them episodes like episodes for another day. So they they're like quadrupeds with wings, right? That's how yes. most dragons are. Quadrupeds work. with wings that can swim like fish. So it's just like flapping its wings and that's mm-hmm. giving it like 95% and then it's just doing like a doggy paddle. Exactly. <laughs> I can see that. Absolutely. Little, it's like little, little paddles. Little claw arms. Loop, well, loop, they're not loop, little, loop. but yeah. <laughs> Little comparatively to their large wings. So bronze dragons in general have a very strong sense of justice and order. And because of their innate powerful nature, uh, they feel a responsibility to champion these concepts and make their ideals a reality. Uh, As such, they have a deep disdain for treachery, cruelty, tyranny, and anarchy. Many pirates, robbers, and despots have faced the swift retribution of a bronze dragon, dispensing justice, if you will. Okay. Um, Though this is mostly a good thing when bronze dragons do this, uh, many bronze dragons tend to have an arrogant and inflated sense of self that tends to put them at odds with those they meet, especially those with differing opinions. Okay. Um, So they're just, they're a bit on the self-righteous side of things. Um, And in very extremely rare cases, this self-righteous outlook can grow into a far more sinister, benevolent tyrant type thing. Yeah, that sounds like for the greater good sort right, of deal. Right, very like, much so. We have to kill all these people or X happens. I could definitely see a bronze going down that dark path. Um, but yeah, a benevolent like tyrant type uh, kind of uh, character flaw where a bronze might take over the lesser re- races in its region and dictate all things in their own realm. Oh man. So like, you guys suck <laughs> only under me. Will only we under me. Righteous. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's exactly it. Cool. Now, obviously that's extremely rare, but it's just, it's kind of a cool creative thing that you can do. That's a little different. I mean, if you're looking for a uh, like 
real like morally gray campaign hook, this sounds like a good option. Yeah, I mean, it's a good way to make a bronze dragon a villain, which is not something you see a lot. So, and uh, I think that'd be fun. Or like so. you have a villain and then you usurp them, and the bronze dragon assumes control because you're all incompetent murder hobos. Indeed. And then you got to deal with now <laughs> you, you got to deal, deal with, with that. that. It's cool for a while, but then you realize I should probably kill everyone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so morality is important to bronze dragons, much like what we talked about with silver dragons. But unlike silvers, bronze dragons are less keen on content contemplating their ideals and more keen on like actually getting something done. They're all about action. That's good. That's which, different. which is good. And it is different. And I think bronze dragons play their role in promoting good in the cosmos. So this yearning to take action and to put their natural size and strength to good use makes bronze dragons the most likely to become directly involved in the warring affairs of humanoids, uh, especially when these warring affairs encroach on uh, the bronze dragons territory. Um, Bronze dragons themselves are fascinated with battles and warfare, and if a war or skirmish occurs within their observance, they're very likely to approach, attempt to discern which side, if any, is fighting for what they would consider the good, <laughs> and then offer their services. Um, being dragons, though, um, bronzes have a distinct greedy streak and will always demand a price for their assistance. Oh, wow, really? Um, they, yeah, they will. Oh, but they're going to ask for, like, they're not just going to ask for gold, right? They're going to um, ask they for... Might, they might ask for just straight payment, but they might ask for something more interesting, like what you're thinking like a like a relic or something like, like a that. relic or, or something like, like an that old war item is yeah it, are, are we talking about this is the this is the dragon that does that yeah, yeah. and we're going to talk about their hoarding techniques or not techniques, <laughs> techniques. But they're hoarding. They're, they're <laughs> well the there's American a bit of technique and shit they're like going around the countryside in a van looking they, for like old rusted wheels <laughs> there is a bit of technique to the way they uh acquisition items but we'll get into that later in the episode. Is so. this bike built in the 1940s? <laughs> you must give it to me or I will not fight for you. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, kind of, yeah. That's something they would do. So <laughs> despite their mercenary behavior, though, once a bronze dragon has committed themselves to a cause or an ally, they will become wholly loyal and devout until the conflict ends. <laughs> they have paperwork on them at all times. You have to sign it. Indeed. And contractually the obligates country, them. Exactly. You're giving me that bike. I'm fighting <laughs> to the, the death army. For you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So uh, the ending of these wars and battles does not spell the end of the bronze dragon's involvement of whatever the affair is. Um, bronze dragons are interested in a fair and honorable outcome. It's their ultimate goal for when they become involved in a war. Oh, so wow. They want to make sure to be involved in peace negotiations, treaty signings, uh, military occupations, etc., etc., to ensure tyrannical and oppressive measures are not taken by the victor. Oh, man, that could really cause some waves with whoever you're, like, dealing with. That's um, why, like, they, they demand a price, and they're very upfront about exactly what they're about. So, Oh, so if you decide, like, oh, man, this guy's probably going to see this through a little too far for my taste, mm -hmm. maybe bypass hiring them. Yeah, exactly. But if you're, like, a righteous king or whatever, and your, your ideal is lining up with this brass dragons, it's probably going to be... Bronze, but yes. Oh, bronze, sorry. Yeah, no, it's that's It's probably going to be a good time. Exactly. That's exactly right. Okay. So as one would assume, this meddlesome nature uh, brings bronze dragons into contact with humanoids fairly regularly. Uh, luckily, they are a gregarious and inquisitive bunch who enjoy both the company and observance of humanoids. Um, not on the level of silvers, who often live among, you know, the peoples of the world. We talked about that in the Silver Dragons episode. Uh -huh. But bronze dragons are known to, rather than that, to disguise themselves as small animals and observe humanoid's behavior from, like, a distance. Okay. So they're, like, they'll they'll mingle, like, maybe they'll disguise themselves as a rat or whatever and, like, mingle. But they don't want to actually talk oh, wow. to the humans. <laughs> Your palace servants are like, Ricky, did you see that squirrel out there? It hasn't blinked in, like, three days. It's just been chilling. <laughs> I don't yeah. know what's up with it, man. Yeah, I that could distinctly be a bronze dragon who's I, very, very bad at like camouflaging into his. I threw a dish ceramics. towel out there; it didn't even flinch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's okay. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, so yeah, this this is often how a bronze decides to become involved in a fight, becoming a small bird and spying on all sides to determine what the circumstances are. Um, even when deciding to involve themselves in a fight or rescue a group of pirates or a shipwreck, a bronze is likely to assist while polymorph. So sometimes when they get involved in these fights, um, let's say they don't want to demand a price, they'll they'll turn into an animal and just not reveal that a dragon was involved in helping at all. So a bronze dragon is likely to assist while polymorph, whether as a dolphin rescuing a, a drowning uh, person, a giant shark seeking sinking a pirate vessel, or as a humanoid warrior leading a troop leading troops against the evil sea creatures. Oh my my God. Yeah. A well-performing interference in mortal affairs should leave said mortals unaware a dragon was ever present. 
the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> if, yeah. if a bronze dragon does reveal its true form, it's likely because shit has gotten fucking real. Can you imagine trying to track that down as adventurers, like hearing right. like a weird story about a giant shark that bit a ship in half? Right, right. Like it was like one yeah. survivor or whatever. And you find yeah. out it was just a dragon. Well, maybe. Like, how would you? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, that's. You, wouldn't, you would never know. Yeah, that that seems like, oh, man, you can do a lot with that. Oh, that, yeah. That's pretty cool. Polymorphing is fun. And with that being said, let's take a short rest. Mm. Or bronze dragons be quite majestic. But do you know it's also majestic? Getting your D&D characters illustrated by a crazy talented artist. Bubble Laser is a freelance artist on Fiverr.com who has been illustrating D&D characters professionally for two years, and she wants to draw your characters. Bubble Laser has illustrated official logos, podcast art, and board game art, but her passion lies in bringing nerdy people's D&D parties and PCs and player characters to life. With hundreds of characters drawn and a five-star rating on Fiverr, you can know your commission character will be well taken care of. What are you waiting for? Click the link in the description, look her up on Fiverr, or find her art page on Facebook or Instagram at Bubble Laser Art and get your characters illustrated today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the part of the episode where we aren't talking about the last thing we were talking about. We're talking about a new thing. We're talking about love. It's love from deep within us. Feel it. Feel our love. Do you feel it? Do you feel it now? <laughs> I feel it. You're in the room with me, though. Yeah, that's true. It's getting weird. It's getting weird. Move on. All right. Let's talk about Patreon. Let's talk about people who came and donated to us. So cool because they loved us. They're returning the love. I mean, that would—that's what I assume. Yeah. Um, but we really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. We're going to start off with somebody that I'm pretty sure I shouted out, but I'm not positive. But it's okay. Uh, thanks for coming on board, Mick Swagger Duff. I, I, is that? I, I don't remember that one, but thanks, Mick Swagger Duff. Oh, okay. Then maybe we're good. I think we're good. Thanks, Mick Swagger Duff. <laughs> uh, how about let's thank uh, Cameron McGowan again. Thanks, Cameron. Uh, for upping your pledge. Appreciate it. Indeed. Uh, let's talk about the Wild Tanuki. That's a great name. <laughs> Thanks, Wild Tanuki. Thanks, Wild Tanuki. And then, uh, yeah, man. Thanks, guys. All right. Short well, thank list you, this guys. Time. Short list this time, but That's we cool. appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, we really do. Thank you, guys. And thank you to all of our patrons that uh, have been consistently supporting us for quite some time now. Um, guys are helping keep the lights on for the show helping us make upgrades um for those of you who are interested in our patreon you can find it at patreon.com slash dungeon cast we offer early episodes Mm -hmm. um a private link to our uh discord exclusive patreon member channel Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh we got uh, a lot of a lot of discussion happens in there it's a lot of fun yeah it's pretty awesome um you can talk to me and will in there a lot we're in there all the time um we got the next tier up is a live game and some other live game stuff. Yeah, we got a few live games. We got the old Vault Raider series. Those are awesome. Um, that's in the five. You can get that in the, the $5 yeah. tier. And then what else is in five? Anything else? That's it. It's early episodes and Vault Raiders. Okay. So there's three episodes of live game stuff. I think we got video and audio. Indeed we do. Um, uh, what's in tier 10? In tier 10, or we have the, tier, the Electrum say. tier. We have the ongoing live play of uh, Flashbang and the Surgeon. It's a Batman the Animated Series plugged into Dungeons and Dragons with two superhero characters, personas, and we just play D&D in like old Batman the Animated Series, like renditions, like like the episode. I take the episode, I boil it down to a D&D like session, and mm-hmm, we just play mm-hmm. it out. Awesome. And however it plays out, it plays out. So we got a lot of cool, like, old classic villains. Um, I believe we have our Halloween special on, on Tier 10 as well. Halloween special. Electrum Tier, again, which is awesome. We all yeah, play evil characters. Fun. Ranger I, Danger, where we are Ranger all, Danger. I forgot about Ranger Danger. We're yeah, all that Rangers. Was, that's a lot of fun. It's got a kick-ass theme song, apparently. It does. It really does. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's got, uh, what else does 10 have? Is that, um, is that where you're putting the OST? That's where we're putting the OST. Okay. And um, for the early episode listeners today... It's not available yet, but by the time this episode airs, it will be. It'll be done this week, pretty much. Cool we're, we're recording ahead of time like we normally do. Is so, that it for Elect- Electrum Tier? I believe that's it for Electrum Tier. Okay, so at Gold Tier, we have uh, our exclusive yearly item, which this year is a shout-out to Demogorgon Mug. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. 
and like, uh, people seem to like it a lot. So if you're interested that. in the mug, go check it out. Okay. Yeah, it's, and, a, it's, a, yeah, it's a mug. And then for our platinum tier. It has tier, the things we'll set on it. Indeed, indeed it does. And then for our platinum tier, we don't have any like hard physical reward or content reward, but I do award anyone who is kind enough and generous enough to actually give it to us on that tier level. Um, I permanently name an NPC in our um, YouTube live D and D game Super Quest Saga. I name an NPC after that um, Patreon user. And of course, you get all the benefits of the old tiers and our ongoing yeah. love and respect. Um, so, if you go to, to our Patreon, you can check out like what our goals are. Like when we make a certain amount on Patreon, we usually go buy something kick ass that really helps out the quality of the show. We've already bought like a new uh, new interface for our our microphones. We bought new microphones and stands. We bought new lighting. We've been able to buy green screens. Um, We've been able to start new projects. And it's, it's all true. thanks to you guys. So thank, so you, thank guys you guys very much. Yeah. Um, I think that's pretty. Oh, our, our ongoing contest is now over by the time this airs. Um, and congratulations we'll, to whoever won. We don't know who you are now, but we we'll will know who you are later. <laughs> and with that, let's get back to the show. Let's get back to the show. So we're back on the coast talking about bronze dragons. Let's do it. We're back on the coast. Oh, that's, that's right. They, that's like where to, they, live. they like to live there. <laughs> and that's actually the next part of my notes. So as I said before, bronze dragons are well known as coastal dwelling creatures. They like to lay out and get that, that oxidization. They, indeed. They like to catch those rays for sure. Catch um, them rays. So most choose to build their lairs in coastal cliffs upon uh, deserted isles or within hidden coves. That's part of also why I like these dragons is like I'm really partial to the beach and like the idea of like a dope ass cove layer just sounds amazing to me. <laughs> that is cool. So that's another reason I love these guys. So are these bronze dragons like bachelors? Are they like are <laughs> I'm they sure. wooing the opposite sex? I'm sure some of them are and some of them do. Come to my sweet beach lair. I'll show you my horde. Indeed. <laughs> So uh, some bronze dragons forego land-based layers at all and actually just straight make their homes underwater within like enormous kelp forests or underwater caverns or even inside like enormous sunken ships. Ooh, that's um, so fucking cool. It is really cool. They can breathe water, so it's not a big deal for them. They, they can they can do either or. There should have been a bronze dragon in the Super Mario 64 level with that giant sunken ship. I've never played Mario 64. I've always Whoa, meant to. We should phone. play it on uh, TDC Plays. Oh, man. <laughs> that definitely evens the score a little bit. On uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's plenty of classics show. I've never touched. Oh man, um, dude! That, but I've always have, meant to. We have a gaming channel. I know we're working on it. So we're Mario getting to 64 it. 64 is like a oh man. Okay, I'm move, bronze, Moving bronze on. dragons, bronze dragons. So they swim fast. Uh, they do. They don't need breaststrokes. They got uh, doggy paddle, wing combo. Indeed. So okay. in even rarer cases, but not completely unheard of, some bronze dragons choose to live in freshwater locales such as an enormous lake or even large rivers. Oh, um, okay. Again, not too common, but hey, it happens. Like fish, like hey. uh like dolphins. Aren't there freshwater dolphins? There are freshwater dolphins. Like dolphins. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. There are some dolphins that live um in the Amazon River. What? Indeed. And when it floods uh, in the rainforest, they're straight swimming through the jungle. I've seen videos. It's amazing. <laughs> that sounds... It's well, really cool. We're watching that after the show. <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, man, what do they do about the piranhas? Um, I'm sure they eat the piranha- piranhas or fucking dolphins. <laughs> what? Really? Dolphins eat fish, bro. I guess that's true. Yeah. Anyways, back to bronze dragons. <laughs> yeah, okay. So regardless of where they choose to live, bronze dragons often gather in congregations. They like they like silvers are quite social with each other. Uh, young bronzes are encouraged to swim and play with each other as children. Um, their groups are not as structured or as permanent as silver clans, but they are very important to bronze dragon society. Okay, it's an important part of just mature development. So like silver dragons would like mosey about finding like a mate in a social setting, but a bronze dragon might participate in like speed dating. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is really good. Yeah, they're absolutely. That's inn. absolutely exactly they're in the lobby of an inn with a bunch of bronze I dragons, mean, just like <laughs> rotating tables. That, be, that, <laughs> that being said, courtship between bronzes <laughs> is a respectful and serious affair. My friend, it's serious speed dating. It's serious they're speed into, dating. They're into did I accidentally segue into like a part of your you notes. You super did. That was the next part of my notes for sure. Yes. Uh, uh, bronze dragons do mate for life, uh, even often refusing to take a new mate if their previous one has died. Okay. So they're pretty serious about it. Uh, bronze dragons are dutiful and loving parents to their offspring, uh, ready to fight to the death to defend their babies. That's cool. Indeed. As one would expect. That's relatable. Relatable. Indeed. <laughs> I would hope so. Somewhat. Yeah. Um. <laughs> 
hopefully many people. Bronze dragons are very much an important influence of good in their respective regions, and as such, come into contention with evil entities fairly regularly. I bring this up because, like, silvers are also um, important influences of good, but remember, they're not very active. They want people to be able to, like, defend themselves, and they'll help people. Exactly. But they're not actively, they're not, like, this beacon of good warding off evil. Bronze dragons are exactly that. Um, okay. Which is why I think it's good to have both. And when we do the Gold Dragons episode sometime this year, uh, I feel like they are their own type of beacon of good, uh, like warding off evil, but in a much different way from Bronze Dragons. But we'll nice. get into that another day. Uh, bronze Dragons often find themselves warding off Black and Blue Dragons due to the shared favorite terrain. Um, oh, hell yeah. They also find themselves in enmity of the various evil sea creatures of the world. Krakens, Moreau, Sahawajin, Aboliths, etc. Like, there's plenty of evil sea creatures for them to eat and kill. So these are the world the world roaming dragons that are like balancing the scales no the bronze dragons pick a place and then like that locale becomes goddamn protected okay so it's it's much like how like a chromatic dragon would go about like they exactly. Pick a spot they stick it out mm-hmm, they mm-hmm. En- encroach upon thy lands etc but Ex- the bronze yeah. will encroach upon thy justice exactly right okay gold dragons are the ones out there in the world like exploring and, that's right yeah and we'll they get into that in the gold like dragons about. episode so silvers are like chilling like making good making good moves mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. they finally figure out what to do bronze dragons are like they, they really do they really are just like dragon mercenaries they really are. Okay. But what I like about uh, specifically bronze, gold, and silver dragons is like their influence kind of like is this triumphant of good influence that really complements each other really well. That is that is a good point. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty cool. Um, coppers and brass, they don't really fit into that. We'll talk about them when they get their own episode. But okay. yeah, in spite of all this goodness and lawfulness, bronze dragons are quite acquisitive, uh, acquisitive and a bit greedy. So they, they like they like their money. Get that shmoney. Um, they like that shmoney. They spend uh, time looting sunken ships and vessels of pirates or enemies they defeat in battle. Um, when they offer their fighting services with... Uh, when they offer their fighting services, they often do so at a fee, which is something we said earlier. While observing humanoids on their ships, while disguised as a small animal form, they will likely attempt to infiltrate the cargo holds of said ships and uh, private vaults of said ships to discover items that they desire so that they can then approach in dragon form and offer a trade. Okay. <laughs> so sure. that's that's the technique of theirs. It's like, <laughs> get on board as a squirrel or a rat or whatever, go into the cargo hold, find out they have a dope sword that you want, and then approach and be like, hey, I hear you have this dope sword that I want. <laughs> and then, yeah, go from hey, there. Todd, have you seen that seagull <laughs> over on the starboard side? How long do you think it's been there? Well, now that you mention it, it's been a few days. It's not blinking, mate. No, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure they would blink in animal form. I'm just saying. They're just too intently watching. I know. They don't want to blink. They don't want to miss any of this action. <laughs> they got to get their negotiating on later. Indeed. <laughs> Bronze dragons prize war-related treasures above more traditional ones. So old war vessels, collections of war histories, ancient battle armors and weapons, etc. Um, due, due to their proximity to the sea, though, the monetary wealth that they do hoard tends to be gemstones, especially per Pearls, um, ceramics and statues because most metals will corrode in the salty environment. I was going to say, like, do they have like a humidified, like the right humidified, like cavern to put all their. <laughs> Unfortunately, like, not. Um, I bet they do. But have gold's some great pretty good because gold doesn't corrode in salty that, environments. That's true. I bet they've got some sick chests that they do keep some of the, some metal stuff in. Yeah. Like, they, they probably don't. They probably like get they don't stuff have any. specially made. Yeah. <laughs> so, brown dragons have voracious appetites, but this is rarely problematic as they can easily live off the sea's bounty. Um, they eat kelp fish, crustaceans, uh, you know, and basically anything else. Um, but their favorite delicacy is shark meat. So oh, it's said that a bronze dragon that takes up residency uh, on a shore will probably um, wipe out the shark population in that area within a few months. What the hell? Yeah. <laughs> they're just like, like, they like they're shark they're meat. fucking eco terrorists. <laughs> I mean, they become the alpha predator. <laughs> I'm the master commander. Indeed. There can only be one. There can only be one. Scavengers are the... Indeed. So, <laughs> Watch qu- my breaststroke with my wings. Any uh, questions about bronze dragons? We're going to move on to the uh, layer stats and the and the actual stat block and all that. I want the layer stats. Okay. So... I want to know. Their layers, like, their coolest, the coolest part of the, this dragon to me yeah. is speed dating and their speed horde. Speed dating and their horde. Yeah. Um, so, a bronze dragon's layer... Uh, a bronze dragon layers in coastal caves, like we said before, but uh, we, we are already mentioned all the other various places that they can mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. layer up. 
Layer actions. Uh, again, initiative count of 20 is when these actions can be taken. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, before we do the layer actions, let's talk about regional effects. I feel like that's, oh, yeah, that's the, a little better. the right approach. You're walking approach. up to this ocean cave. You're watching up to What's the... What's going on? Exactly. So, is this a piece of bronze on the floor? What a region the containing a bronze <laughs> dragon's layer is warped by the dragon's magic. Once per day, the dragon can alter the weather in a six-mile radius centered on its layer. The dragon doesn't need to be outdoors. Otherwise, the effect is identical, identical to the control weather spell. Underwater plants within six miles of the dragon's lair take on dazzlingly brilliant hues. Oh, cool. Within its lair, the dragon can set illusory sounds such as soft music and strange echoes so that they can be heard in various parts of the lair. So they totally got surround sound throughout That's their lair. That's pretty cool. Some echolocation stuff. <laughs> Indeed. All right. <laughs> um, now let's get to lair actions. So on initiative count of 20, these actions can be taken by the dragon or, yeah, by the dragon. The dragon creates a fog as though it had cast the fog cloud spell. The fog lasts until initiative count 20 on the next round. Um, and then there's one more action. A thunderclap originates at a point the dragon can see within 120 feet of it. Each creature within a 20 foot radius centered on that point must make a DC 15 constitution saving throw or take 5 or 1d10 thunder damage and be deafened until the end of its next turn. That's rad as fuck. It's pretty cool. Um, I have noticed that the metallic dragon layer actions are distinctly weaker than the chromatic ones. and I, that I'm okay with that. I think that makes sense because they're less likely to maliciously you, you, they have much less malicious intent in general, so like their magic isn't kind of geared towards that. Yeah, and like if we're gonna like trope it up a little bit, mm-hmm. uh, an evil lair is like the, you call it a lair, you don't right. think of like a, a good being, true, I think of like a mad yeah. scientist or something like that. Yeah, some more evil, like sinister things are gonna happen, just like you're, the point you're trying to make right now. Makes sense, so like, mm-hmm. yeah, it's just like a defense, like. Lots of people have security systems. Why wouldn't a bronze dragon have something to help protect its horde, pretty much? Right. So let's get into the stat block. Uh, ancient bronze dragon, gargantuan dragon, lawful good. We're looking at armor class 22, natural armor. Hit points, 444. He has a uh, flying speed of 40 feet. No, has a walking speed of 40 feet, a flying speed of 80 feet, and a swimming speed of 40 feet. There's nowhere that you can go to get away from this goddamn dragon. Right. We're looking at a strength of 29, so massively strong. Dex of 10, constitution of 27, intelligence 18, wisdom 17, and charisma 21. Um, It's got dark vision. It's got blind sight. um, It's got all the stuff all the dragons got. But it also has amphibious, which means the dragon can breathe both air and water. It has its legendary resistance, so three times a day, the dragon, uh, if it fails a saving throw, can just choose to succeed instead. So it's dope. Yeah, it's got its fright, frightful presence, which is the same as all other dragons. You know, it just it gives off an aura of fear that you have to make a wisdom save for. In this case, it's a DC 20. Mm. Um, it can make multi-attacks with its bite, claw, and tail, all of which do massive damage. We're looking 2d10 plus 9, 2d6 plus 9, 2d8 plus 9, um, all with plus 16 to hit. Um, all of them with a massive reach, uh, 15 foot, 10 foot, 20 foot reach. Um, moving around these dragons is difficult because everything's a fucking opportunity attack. Oh, yeah. huh? Yeah. yeah. So they just like throw out whatever they got, like facing your direction. Yeah. They're also immune to lightning, which is important. Oh, um, wow. That's much like good. blue dragons. Well, um, like that's don't they fight blue dragons? Like that's a really good it is. Like, ability to have if you're going to go head to head with one yeah. of those bad boys. Indeed it is. And speaking of breathing, um, their breath weapons, they have two because they're a metallic dragon. The first one is lightning breath. And I'm pretty sure it's just oh. identical to uh, the blue dragons. A dragon excels lightning in a 120 foot line that is 10 foot wide. Each creature in that line must make a DC 23 dexterity saving throw or take 16 D 10 lightning damage on a failed save. Mm. How much on a successful one? That's so massive. Of, that's like, a damaging. lot. That's 16 a lot. D10. Average is 88 damage. Like, just, it's daunting to, like, roll that many dice. I know, it <laughs> the, really like, is. Like, dice apps Count are Count it up. Yeah. <laughs> the, Give me your D6 is now. Yeah. That We're reminds me of the die. last Super Quest Saga episode. Yeah, that's it. Like, happen. everyone give me your D6s. It was D10s. Um, it was D10s. Oh, yeah. yeah. Was everyone give me your D10s. scarier than D6s by that, four. That is true. Or so, so. Um, bronze dragons being metallic dragons, they have a secondary breath, which is a non-lethal breath. It's always a non-lethal breath, usually with some sort of status effect. Yeah, I do like the second breath option. It's pretty cool. Right. Especially if they're fighting blues, 
well, guess what? They have a secondary breath they can rely on. They can actually use. I was going to say, like, right. like a head-to-head fight with these guys is like, well, it's just a muscle fight at that point because they're not going to Yeah, pretty much. Other. Although the blue dragon will out-muscle a bronze dragon by a fair amount. But they got this breath, though. Indeed. So is it a scale tipper? The, maybe. The second breath a bronze dragon has is called repulsion breath. The dragon excels repulsion energy in a 30-foot cone. Each creature in that area must succeed on a DC 23 strength saving throw. On a failed save, the creature is pushed 60 feet away from the dragon. I thought you were going to say grossed out. <laughs> and probably that too. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, What's all, repulsion energy? Is that like is that like sound? Is that like um, f- it could be. I think you would want to flavor it however you wish. It could just be like um, you know, like Cyclops. His beams aren't actually heat lasers. They're just they're like kinetic yeah. energy that kind of punch you. Yeah, it could be like that. It's literally eye beams. There's yeah, it could no be other way to pu- you know just a punch beam out of its throat. Punch beam. Um, is that like the the Sun Soul Monk like doing uh, like like radiant force damage or whatever from like range. Um, well, the Sensible Monk does radiant damage, so that is radiant burns, damage, kind of. I imagine. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I'm trying to equate it to like something. Or do we have? Is there any other creature that has like repulse, da- like this type of flavor um, on it? Well, I'm sure we're going to come across more and more as okay. we keep going. Yeah, that's more. I of, guess let us know in the comments. Let, um, let yeah, me know. I'm sure there's plenty. Yeah. Um, as all other metallic dragons can. Um, bronze dragons have the ability to polymorph at will. They don't need to spend a spell slot because they're dirty cheaters and they can so just broken. do that. I know. Meanwhile, chromatic dragons just have to learn the spell, which is fine because they can do that easily. But they can do that, but they got to waste resources on it. Indeed. That's a good uh, leg up for good dragons to do the things they want to do. Right. And then um, we have the legendary actions, which are identical to all other dragons we talked about. We're looking at a detect. Um, which costs one legendary point, a tail attack, which costs one legendary point, and a wing attack, which costs two legendary point. The wing attack's a little special. Beats its, the dragon beats its wings. Each creature within 15 feet of the dragon must succeed on DC 24 dexterity saving throw or take 2d6 plus 9 bludgeoning damage and be knocked prone. The dragon can then fly up to half its speed, uh, half of its flying speed. So, oh my god, he can knock you over and then like roll up on you? Um, yeah, basically. Oh, or knock everyone down and then fly away because it doesn't want to bother. But oh, that's true. This is where I begin to have more and more of a problem with 5e's dragon stat blocks. Because on one hand, it can be difficult to make these things powerful enough if you have a very competent party and they just want to go Mm toe-to-toe and you have to like play extra clever with the dragon, which is fine. But I have my problems with that. But I also have my problem where every single fucking dragon looks exactly the goddamn same with the exception of their breath has a just basically a different element. It's like, obviously they are like, the same as creatures, but it'd be cool if we could like, I don't know, get a little more diversity in the stat a little more diversity in the, like even just the legendary actions. Maybe they'd be cool if we integrated something special about each dragon within their legendary actions. I I mean, it's not a bad way to design like a pool of monsters like this when you want a lot of variety. Like, we don't just have one dragon. We've got 10 dragons. So mm-hmm. you're like, you're already kind of asking for, for a, a lot, lot like yeah. right off the bat. This but, is true. But now that you have this lore and you're, mm-hmm. you're making like additional books and stuff. Let's get co- some variants. Yeah. It would be yeah. cool to ha- add variations. Like, Hey, yeah. if may- maybe that's something like they need, you know how in the dungeon master's guide, there's all these optional rules to play. Mm-hmm, they're, mm-hmm. they're really solid. I, I like a lot of them. Yeah. What about a monster manual with the variants? Like, Hey, you have your bronze dragon, <laughs> an actual monster manual too. That like, it goes back to monster manual one and has variants for every monster in monster manual one. You would probably need to break cool. if you want to like compile all the stuff you printed monster wise and get it into a, like, it would probably be volumes one and two, almost like um tome of beasts. They, they've got two volumes for tome of beasts. Like they do. That's they do. a, that's a great book. I just wish it was like official content, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's great. I like it's that. Great book. Content. It's great content. It's got good stuff in it and it, it blends really well with, like anytime I've used something from Tomo Beast, it's fit in really well into my five E game. So Yeah. No, I think a Tomo Beast follows its own setting of some sort. I'm not sure. I haven't really looked into it, but I'd be curious to know um, what that setting is. I've never read like I've never sat down and like read Tome of Beast. I just kind of flipped through it and like, oh, <clears> this <throat> looks awesome. Let's do it. Yeah, I, I've tried to integrate it into a lot of my research, but it's just completely and utterly different from anything that's official. So I just don't. I mean, it, it wouldn't really make sense for our show. We're trying to stick to the, like, the 5e official right, content. Right, With that being said, uh, do you have any questions about Bronze Dragons? Um, 
No, nah, no. Nah, <laughs> okay. Nah. All right. Well, with that being said, uh, let's get ready for a long rest. And today I would like to promote our 5e live play that's on YouTube and in podcast form called Super Quest Saga. A show where Super we, Quest Saga. The show where we here at the Dungeon Cast sit around the table and play some Dungeons and Dragons instead of just talking about it. Um, but not just any Dungeons and Dragons. We play space, space sci-fi adventure Dungeons and Dragons where you guys play a party of time displaced adventurers who have been... Uh, Time displaced into 100,000 years <laughs> into the future. And we are adventuring. And you are adventuring. And shit's getting wild with gala- evil galactic elves. And, and now you're in like the there was that the dope, goblin like, uh, uh, Republic home- territory. Man, spo- I almost said major spoilers. But like, the guys, this is the right time to get into the show. Right. The, it, we have like, what do we have? Like almost close to 20 episodes <laughs> We're out We're getting now. close to 20 episodes. We've finished off the first two arcs There's of two the story. story arcs. There's like just enough content to like really get a feel for what we're doing here and like get involved and attached. I've been seeing a lot of people getting like attached to the characters lately, mm-hmm, which is mm-hmm. like really rewarding as, yeah. as a player. Like feedback's they, been wonderful. Yeah. And, the and, positive and, feedback's been and wonderful. And everyone's asking for Will's DM notes. Like, let's see, let's see some <laughs> world building stuff. Like, can right. we look at it? Like, and people yeah. are really hype about it. And I know that me, Jake and Freeland are super hyped for every single game because we want to know what happens next. And we have such a good time being able to participate. So, and that's just a testament to the job Will is doing. Thank you, man. Running the game. And it's, we try to add like sound effects and music on my end, on the back end of things in post production to kind of enrich the experience and like really give emphasis to these big moments that that Will puts into the show. There's like really cool twists and turns that have happened so far. I can't say enough about it. It's been a pleasure to play in and I hope you guys check it out and listen to it. Indeed. And with that being said, I think we can call it a game. Let's call it a game. All right, we'll talk to you guys later. Bye.